Thanks for staying with us, everybody. Now a look ahead to 2024. State Auditor Shad White down from the Capitol and with us here on the coast. Good to see you, Mr. White, and good to have you on the Thanks show. Thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, on the heels of statewide elections, really no changes at the top of government, with the exception of a new speaker. The legislature, for the most part, unchanged. Yep. Do you go into a new session and say, this is my uh, agenda for the uh, state auditor's office and this is what I'm lobbying for? We do, and, and really we try to draw, my team and I try to draw on our, our experience over the course of the last year and say, all right, well, what new laws would help us do our jobs a bit better? What are some, in, some good investments for the taxpayers? What yields a big return for the taxpayers? So we try to narrow it down and be very specific. I like, I like goals. I like setting very clear goals and saying, all right, this is what we're going to try to do. Let's try to meet it. And uh, so this year we're, we're putting all of our energy behind about four bills and, and going to see if, uh, if we can persuade lawmakers to go along. Well, I don't want to go spend time on all four. What's the sure. biggest one? I think the biggest one is the whistleblower reward bill that we're pushing for. So right now, if you, if you happen to uh, stumble upon corruption in the federal government and you're a private citizen, you can come forward with evidence to the federal government and you might be eligible to receive a portion of what the government recovers if they realize, oh, you're telling the truth and somebody did actually steal money. But there's no similar law like that for the state. So my argument is, look, I want private citizens to come forward to my office to say, look, I've seen this elected official or this government employee steal this property or steal taxpayer money. And if you happen to be right, we investigate it, we figure it out, and then that person goes to jail and we get a recovery off of that. I think you as a private citizen ought to be eligible to receive a percentage of what we recover. And the whole idea, of yeah, course, I, is I, give I like people that. an incentive, right? Yeah, I like that. You've I mean, already got some ideas for things to yeah, come forward I, with right I now. I don't think we should call it a bounty. <laughs> But I think it's a, right. good, it's, it's a good <laughs> idea. Well, obviously, the biggest story surrounding your office over the last few years is this relentless uh, TANF scandal. You uncovered fraud, demanded repayment from several people, including Brett Favre, assisted in the prosecution on state charges. Uh, you say you're working with the Justice Department because this is really now up to them as far as anything moving forward. Can you give us an update on where that might be? Your summary is exactly right. So think back to 2020, you know, we had investigated for about six, seven months, and we saw evidence that even more welfare money was about to be misspent. So we took our findings to the local DA in Hines County, and, and as always, we, we dig up the facts. We don't get to decide who faces charges, but when we took that information to him, he said, yes, I'm gonna go ahead and indict six people that effectively put a stop to the big fraud scheme. So unfortunately before that, the state missed out on about $100 million of misspent uh, TANF money. But that really uh, ended the fraud scheme. And then right after that, we turned everything we had over to the FBI and the Department of Justice. And the federal prosecutors at that point said, look, what we would like to do is we would like you, state auditor and the local DA, to focus on those six people that have already been indicted, make sure they're held accountable. And we would like responsibility for anybody else beyond those first six folks. We like to take a look at them. We'll use your evidence. We'll do our own investigating too. Of course, the FBI is always going to do that. And then the federal prosecutors will make the final decisions about anybody have else. You heard where that case is now? Is it stalled? So, so uh, one thing I would say is that justice takes time, unfortunately, but there's, there's good news here. Um, the Justice Department now has a new representative down here, new U.S. Attorney for the Southern District. Joe Biden appointed uh, Mr. Todd G., who's the U.S. Attorney down here. He and I have met. We had a great meeting about the DHS case and a number of other cases that, that we've got in front of them. And so um, without telling you his exact position, I'll, I'll sort of summarize. I think he's going to take a hard look at all the evidence. He's going to make his own mind up about who should be charged. And I wasn't given a timeline, mm -hmm. uh, a clear timeline line for when that would be done but my guess is that sometime in the next year you'll hear I don't know if you could answer this and a one word answer is there anything there there you know, it depends on what they continue to learn in these last few weeks from the final things that they're doing. And, and then, of course, in talking to the six people who have already pleaded guilty. So those folks who have already pleaded guilty using our evidence, they're now cooperating with these federal prosecutors. So at the end of the day, they're going to take all that information in. Some of that they may not even share with me or the local DA, and they're going to make a call. Now, you testified before a House committee in Washington. The subject was, where is all the welfare money going? Testimony indicated that nationally about 78% of federal and state funding actually goes to non-assistant spending and projects. So this yep. is a national crisis. 
You made some recommendations. Uh, what, would, what do you think was the most important one? It, it's absolutely right. So a lot of the welfare money across the United States goes to nonprofits. And that's fine. We have some great nonprofits. But what we saw here in Mississippi is that if you have a nonprofit that is being run by folks who want to take that money, it can be very easy for them to steal that money. So I recommended to Congress, look, let's get serious about monitoring these nonprofits. When you see in an audit report that the nonprofit is not being monitored, the feds need to come in and check on that. I think the heads of, of welfare agencies, so, so the state agency heads around the country, ought to be signing statements under penalty of perjury saying this is the number of poor people that we helped with this money. If you put, to, put into place all of these preventative mechanisms, these, these fraud prevention mechanisms, I think you would see less of a problem. But you're absolutely right. The reason Congress is interested in this is they saw what happened in Mississippi and they're afraid it's going on in a bunch of other states. Yeah, well, it apparently is. Uh, you also brought to light, and I don't think I've seen much reported on this, $590 million in unemployment compensation misspent from the COVID money? Yep, yep. <laughs> That's it's ridiculous. a baffling amount. It absolutely is. Well, uh, what's going to happen with that? So, so the sad truth in that matter is that a lot of people who don't live in Mississippi scammed our system and they got access to our unemployment compensation. So some of those folks are folks living in their mom's basement in New York. They may be in Singapore or Nigeria or somewhere else. So this really, uh, this really happened all around the country during the COVID pandemic. A lot of people scammed unemployment systems. You know, we lost half a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. California lost $11 billion wow. to fraud. So the, the truth of the matter is we know the number, but our odds of getting a lot of that money back are very, very slim. Oh. We just need to fix the system. Okay, we only have like a couple of minutes after sure. the most, so let's do kind of a lightning round. Sure, here, hit me, uh, If on. you don't mind. Hit me. <laughs> hit you. I on. like it. <laughs> now, I, I've lived in Mississippi about 40 years. I don't ever remember a state auditor taking on a lot of social and political issues like you have. <laughs> so it looks seems like you're kind of redefining uh, the auditor. Let's talk about one. Sure. Uh, fatherlessness, and boy, did you get make, make some people mad with this one. I don't know why you'd people <laughs> make people mad with with this. You talked about how it leads to a vicious kind of cycle of problems for yeah. Mississippi. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is one of our fundamental challenges as a state. You know, when you look at the fact that we have more children born into single parent homes here in Mississippi than any other state, this is particularly challenging because fast forward down the road, kids that grow up in a home without a, an engaged father 20 times more likely to go to prison, nine times less likely to finish high school, five times more likely to end up in poverty. And so when I said all this out loud, example, a Democratic lawmaker said, oh, you're being very, very racist. You can't say well, this. Well, they're racist for assuming that's racist. Well, well the, the in stats- In my opinion. I, the stats I just quoted, I pulled from a Barack Obama speech. So, so they didn't think it was racist back then. The point is that these are just facts. Whether you like them or not, these are facts. And so we need to think about this issue as a state. And there are real, there are real solutions here and it doesn't involve you know forcing daddies to go back into the home necessarily what it involves a lot of times is getting a mentor in front of these kids who grow up in broken homes and we've seen mentorship programs all around the state oh, flourish okay. and work a couple other ones very sure. quickly you took on the uh, universities and I think primarily Ole Miss in my opinion <laughs> when you talked about uh, DEI right uh, diversity equity inclusion you think yep. they're spending way too much state money on it Yes. So and this made a lot of people mad too. It did. And and look, I I think that uh, a lot of our universities are spending money on this because it's a national trend right now and because DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, those are nice sounding words, but when you dig into what they're paying for with this money, they're they're teaching sessions telling kids that the only remedy to to past discrimination is future discrimination. That's in one of the actual sessions that, that got taught. And we're paying for that. We're paying for that with taxpayer money. So my whole point has been, look, if you wanna promote diversity at the universities, stop funding programs like that that indoctrinate kids, and maybe let's just have scholarships for kids that are from poor neighborhoods. Yeah. That would be a much better way well, of doing it. Well, you're this. gonna have to come back down because I still had some things to talk <laughs> about, including your Anytime. plans for 2027. <laughs> Uh, I'm enjoying my job right okay, now. That's good. what I would say. State Auditor <laughs> Shad White, uh, you know, there's going to the governor will be term limited. In I had heard that. Yeah, I had heard that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, good I do see, enjoy my job though. <laughs> good to see you, and thanks for being with us on the coast. Thanks, Dave.